But uh, welcome to all of you. We are starting off another Suds and Science season. Very happy to be doing so. Yeah, we, we took a hiatus during the summer and early fall, and, and we're back. And we'll be back until um, June or so. Every month, first Tuesday of every month. So I'm Chris Rimmer. I'm the Executive Director for Vermont Center for Eco Studies. I know many of you, but not all. And it's great to see you all here. Um, and for those of you that don't know about VCE, I think many of you do, and I'll just say a word or two. Uh, we are a local uh, nonprofit here in Norwich, and we do uh, some pretty exciting wildlife conservation research and, and monitoring. And I would invite you to um, learn about us, visit our website, become involved as a citizen scientist, volunteer. We, we rely on people like all of you to go out and do some of our heavy lifting in the field, collecting data on animal populations that we use for conservation. Uh, we would love to have you support us, of course. Um, so please do visit our website and, and get involved if you're not already. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Jeremy Silva, who I just met for the first time. But uh, his reputation precedes him to some extent because uh, he's become fairly well known, at least in certain circles recently. Uh, Jeremy is a Norwich resident, first of all. Uh, but he is a, and I'm going to get this wrong, a paleoanthropologist. Yeah. <laughs> and a professor at Dartmouth College in the uh, Department of Anthropology. And his specialty, which he will tell you a great deal more about, is. Um, early hominids. Um, and I do know that he specializes in the um, foot and ankle uh, region of the uh, early hominid body. So I'm just going to let him take it away and, and, and uh, thrill us all with his knowledge and insights. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, I only wear a tie. I understand it's very informal, and I can see that now. And I only wear a tie so I can illustrate some of the fossils <laughs> that we discovered. So I don't have a big screen here, so I can show you these, these fossils. And I have fossils in my pocket, too. You always have to have cross, right? Have fossils. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about, tonight about uh, human evolution yes. and, and where we came from. And we've made some really wonderful discoveries recently in South Africa, the country of South Africa, these cave uh, deposits that have yielded extraordinary fossils, and I'm gonna to talk to you guys about that uh, uh, tonight. So what I have behind you two are skulls of a human and a chimpanzee, and those are close relatives, those are cousins of each other. Our closest living relative is the chimpanzee, and that doesn't mean that we evolved from a chimpanzee, right? Human evolution, the way evolution works is that we share common ancestry. We didn't come from a chimp any more than a chimp came from us. So humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor, and we can study the genetics of chimpanzees and the genetics of humans to estimate more or less when that common ancestor existed. And we think it was about 7 million years ago, which sounds like a long time, but in the grand scheme of things, it really was yesterday. So 7 million years of evolutionary history, which we can figure out, think about, and, 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 and decide or, or, or determine how humans evolved by studying the fossil record. And that's what I do, is study human evolution by examining the fossils. Now, there are fossils found in Ethiopia, like the famous Lucy. Everyone knows about Lucy, right? Famous Lucy skeleton. There are fossils in Tanzania, the Olduvai Gorge, where the leakies worked. And the fossils I'm going to talk to you about came from South Africa. And South Africa has been a place where people have found fossils of early humans for a long time. It started in the 1920s. Actually, it started, I've got props back here, too. It actually started long before then, uh, in the 1800s, when people started funding gold in South Africa. There was a big gold rush to an area that eventually was settled, and that was the, the city of Johannesburg. And to build a city, people need, limes, uh, need concrete to build their buildings, and one of the ingredients in concrete is limestone. And you can find limestone in caves that are surrounding this area in, in, in South Africa. And so miners would go out to these caves, and they'd blast open these caves and, and excavate the limestone, and then use that to build Johannesburg. Well, as they were doing that, what they were also blasting out of these caves were fossils. And those fossils in the 1900s, early 1900s, would make their ways onto, onto people's mantles. And there would be fossils of ancient baboons that people would display and at dinner parties that show, oh, look at this fossil that was blown out of one of these caves. And researchers started getting 
uh, uh, wind of this. They started hearing about these fossils. And there was a particular anatomist at the, uh, in the Department of Anatomy at the University of its Vaudersrand in, jo in, in Johannesburg. And his name is Raymond Dart. And he heard about these ancient fossils. And he, and he contacted these miners. And he said, well, if you happen to find fossils, and they kind of look like monkeys, I'm interested. I'm really interested in these things. And one day, it was actually the day of his best friend's wedding. He was the best man in a wedding. And a box arrived. And he's in his tuxedo, and a box arrives. And he opens up the box, and inside the box is a chunk of rock. And he looks in the chunk of rock, and there's this little face looking back at him. Now, this little face here was not from a baboon. Baboons have much bigger canines than that. And he realized, he knew immediately, he's an anatomist, right? And he knew immediately that this was something special. So he went to his friend's wedding, and he left early, <laughs> skipped the reception, went home, grabbed his wife's knitting needles, and slowly began removing the rock from around this fossil. And what slowly emerged was this absolutely gorgeous little child that we now notice, know as the Taung child, or the Taung means place of the lion. Uh, there are no lions in this area of South Africa anymore, unfortunately. But the Taung child was the first discovery of an early human known as an Australopithecus. And that's what Lucy is. Lucy is the most famous Australopithecus, but this was the first that we knew about from South Africa. And he realized that this was probably, or he hypothesized at least, that this was a human ancestor because it had small canines, tiny little blunt canines. Other primates have these big canines that they use for intimidation. And he also noticed that the hole at the base of the skull where the spinal cord would exit comes right out of the bottom, which means this little creature would have been walking around on two legs rather than if it comes out the back and it would have been moving on all fours. And so this was a critical discovery that human ancestry resides in Africa. And almost no one believed him. This was in the 1920s, and it took until the 1940s, 1950s, eventually with work from the Leakeys, that shifted the focus of human evolution to Africa, and in, in our particular story, in South Africa. So I'm going to fast forward now to the 1990s and early 2000s. And there was a researcher, a colleague and friend of mine, Lee Berger, who was excavating some of these caves in South Africa. A cave known as Gladysville is where he had the permits to excavate. Gladysville is beautiful. Beautiful cave. There are fossils everywhere at Gladysville. Absolutely everywhere. So you walk into Gladysville, and you look in the walls of the cave, and there's just bone trickling out of the walls. It's such a seductive place. There's so many fossils. And he excavated and excavated and excavated, and he found about 20,000 fossils at Gladysville. Fossils of wildebeest and warthogs and elephants and giraffes and baboons and zebras. And of those 20,000, you know how many were early human fossils? Two. Yeah. That's it. A tooth wow. and a finger bone. That was it. And he was frustrated. Right? This is the, the, you're going to spend 20 years of your, of your work looking for early human fossils and you just find two of them. And every year he would go back because it's such a seductive place, so many fossils. This is going to be the year that I dig and find the skull. And he didn't find anything. So he decided to shift gears and search for new caves. And this was, this was you know, around 2006, 2007. There was a brand new thing out known as Google Earth. And he used Google Earth to search for new caves. Instead of going out and trekking around and looking for caves, he wanted to see what they looked like from space. And so he utilized Google Earth. Now, who has, who has used Google Earth? Okay. And what did you first search for when you looked when you use Google Earth? House. Your house, exactly. <laughs> so Lee Berger jumps on Google Earth, and his house, right, he probably looked at his house too, but his house his home, is the cradle of humankind in South Africa, where he's been looking for fossils for 20 years. And he zooms into the cradle of humankind, and what he notices is that the caves can be identified by these clusters of trees that are emerging out of the landscape. So these are vertical cave shafts, and they'll pull water at the base of the caves. Then seeds will fall in, and they will bloom these trees. Olive trees and stinkwood trees are what he was seeing in an otherwise arid landscape. So classic Africa. If anyone's been to this area, this is classic Africa landscape, dry grassland, and then occasionally a cluster of trees. Where do the trees get their water from? From these underground caves. Okay? So they were acting as bullseyes for where the caves were. And he used Google Earth to identify about 300 new caves that nobody knew existed. 300 new caves in one of the most searched areas on Earth for early human fossils. And for these caves, he found 300 new ones. 
and he decided to go explore them and see if they had fossils. And one day in August of 2008, uh, he went to a cave that we, we call Malapa Cave, and he went there with his dog, Tao, and he went there with his son, with his eight-year-old son. And this is Matthew, his son. He said, Matthew, go find some fossils. All right? And Matthew goes running off, and he trips over a rock. And he turns around, and he picks up the rock, he says, hey, Dad, I found a fossil. <laughs> and what he saw sticking out of the rock was this. This was a little bone that was sticking out of the rock. And this is a bone that goes right here. This is a clavicle. This is a collarbone. Antelopes and zebras and many other African animals don't have collarbones. By, having, by seeing a collarbone sticking out of the rock, right away, Lee was able to go through sort of his anatomical Rolodex and say, all right, it's not these animals, because this is a clavicle. It's got to be a primate or a bat or a rodent or a carnivore. Too big for rodent and bat. Scratch those off. Carnivore, wrong shape. This is a primate, and it's not shaped right for a baboon. This is an early human. Whoa. He then flipped over the rock, and on the other side was this bone. And this is the lower jaw of, of, of this, this early human, with a canine sticking up. And remember about early human canines. Are they sharp or dull? Dull. dull. This thing's dull, right there. So immediately he knew he had a special discovery of an early human, and his son had discovered as many fossils as he had in 20 years. <laughs> Should have brought him more often. He then excavated this area, and this is when I started to get involved with the project, and we were able to uh, uh, excavate, uh, or his team was able to excavate two complete skeletons, rather complete skeletons, oh, wow. of an early human. One of which is shown here on my tie. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a, um, uh, a young boy. We call him Karabo, which means the answer uh, in the Sutu language. Uh, so this is a young boy. We, uh, uh, we think he was about 8 to 10 years old when he died. Uh, and then the other skeleton we have is a, uh, an adult female. And they're lying right next to each other. And there's some reason to believe that we have a mother and, and her child. Uh, next to each other. Absolutely extraordinary skeletons. Um, and then the fun began for me, because I work on anatomy. And these anatomies were head to toe different from anything we had ever seen before. And because they were so different from any other creature we'd ever uncovered, it was named a new species, Australopithecus sediba. And I've been working, as Chris said, I work mostly on feet and legs, and I've been working on his feet and legs, not much on his, but her feet and legs are much more complete, and they're really weird. And they show us that she would have walked in a very peculiar kind of way, in a different kind of way than humans walk today, and even in a different kind of way than the famous Lucy walked. And so what we're learning about these discoveries is that human evolution didn't happen in this really simple, linear kind of fashion. So if you think about human evolution, the first image that pops into your head probably is that time-life progress of yes. man image, right? <laughs> and slowly the chimp turning into the human. That's not how it happened. The fossils are giving us a very different story. That it was much more complicated and there were many experiments going on in what it meant to be an upright walking ape at this time two million years ago. Now these fossils are spectacular. They're gorgeous. <coughs> They're yielding so much information. For instance, his skull, where are you? There he is. Yes. He's right here. So his skull is so beautifully preserved. Usually we find these in pieces and we have to glue them back together again. His skull is so beautifully preserved that he still has a little bit of food stuck between his teeth. And that was scraped off, it's, it's plaque essentially, scraped off his teeth, examined under a microscope. Very clever researcher that did this work. And what she noticed was that there were these tiny little, um, uh, uh, essentially the internal skeleton of plant cells, they're known as phytoliths, that were still stuck to his teeth. And they are identifiable, they have a particular shape that tells you what plant it comes from. Mm -hmm. And before he died, right before he died, he was munching on fruit and leaves and tree bark. And so he was up in the trees. We think that these early humans, these hominins, were comfortable in the trees. And when they came down to the ground, they probably would have walked in somewhat of a compromised way because they still had adaptations for life in the trees. So an absolutely extraordinary discovery. Uh, two million years old, we've dated the sediment surrounding the fossils. Uh, to about two million years old, uh, and I'm bringing students back there in about three weeks to, to look for more of these things, to excavate these fossils. Is it three weeks? Sorry, we're going back in, in three weeks to find uh, more of these fossils. So Dartmouth students are going there, 
uh, about 15 students as part of a class, as part of a Dartmouth class. Um, so that is the find of a lifetime, right? Australopithecus sediba, these two skeletons, the find of a lifetime. But of course, Lee Berger um, doesn't stop there. This is sort of our, our modern equivalent of Indiana Jones. And he, he, he goes back out and searches for more and searches for more. And in his mind, he's thinking, all right, remember those 300 caves I found? Well, that was one of them. What about the other 299? What am I going to do? How am I going to explore all of these different caves? And so what he did was he involved local spelunking groups, caving clubs. And he said, all right, here are the GPS coordinates to all these caves. Um, you guys may, may know about them already. Who knows? If you happen to bump into bones, if you see any fossils, here's my card. Uh, send me a call. Uh, give me a call. Send, send, me, send me an email. In October of 2013, I got an email from Lee that said, uh, check this out. And there was a picture attached. Um, and in case you don't know, if you get an email that says, check this out, and there's a picture attached, don't open it. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't do that. Um, but this is from Lee, so I opened it up, and there was a skeleton on my screen, just lying there on the surface of the cave. We never find skeletons just lying there. These, these skeletons are in, in, encased within chunks of rock, like this one. This is a chunk of rock from South Africa. And here is, here is a fossil right there. But it's, yeah, these teeth, exactly. But they're stuck in there. And see if you can get them out. <laughs> exactly, right? It's really difficult. And Raymond Dart used his wife's knitting needles to do it. We now use these little mini jackhammers to slowly send out puffs of air to grain by grain remove the sediment from around the rock. This takes a long time. It takes months. It even can take years to prepare out fossils. And here Lee was sending me a picture of a skeleton just lying there on the surface of a cave. This was extraordinary. What was even more extraordinary were the circumstances of its discovery. They were found, these fossils were found by some amateur cavers. There was a guy who was an accountant by day, another guy who was a construction worker, Rick and Steve. And they went exploring in a cave known as Rising Star Cave. And in the back of the cave, they saw this crevice. It was about maybe seven and a half inches wide or so. And that's inviting, right? So they went squeezing <laughs> through that seven and a half inch crevice. Um, I wanted to, to illustrate to you guys, I have a, a video that shows the seven and a inch, half inch crevice, but I was showing no, no videos tonight. So um, I, I decided to utilize, I used to work at the Museum of Science in Boston. We would always do props and ways of illustrating things. So I brought this box, and this box is about 10 inches wide, so it's bigger than what these guys squeezed through. And I'll try to go through. <laughs> And I can't quite make it. <laughs> I'm having a hard time. This is what they squeeze through, okay? This tiny, now you guys probably could do it. They squeeze through this tiny, <laughs> tiny crevice. Yes, exactly. Oh, the shoulders. Oh, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. This will the shoulder. That's right. <laughs> Wonderful. And now, on the other side of that seven inch squeeze is a 40 foot drop. <laughs> So this is dangerous work. And they went down into, down that 40 foot drop, sort of like a, a chimney though, they could wiggle their way down. And they got to the bottom and there were bones everywhere. But these guys don't know anything about bones. So they took some photographs, sent them to Lee, and then left. But we could tell from the photographs that this, these were fossils. These were early human fossils. This was a special discovery. And this was a vulnerable discovery, just lying there in the surface of the cave. We needed to go get these fossils. So the question was, how are we going to do this? How are we going to organize a team to get these fossils? Because you need people with a particular set of skills. You need people who know their anatomy really well and can go down into the cave and know the difference between a human bone and a zebra bone. And know the difference between a, a humerus and a femur. So people who had a degree in anthropology, anatomy, archaeology, something like that. You needed people who uh, had excavation experience. It wouldn't just go down there and then have no idea how to properly excavate fossils. So we needed people who had on their resume that they had excavated before. We needed people who wouldn't freak out in a cave. Okay? Claustrophobic, right? In a cave that maybe they get down there and they say, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Right? So that, that eliminates me. Um, the first two hours I okay with And what also would eliminate me, as you saw, but wouldn't eliminate you, is that you needed to squeeze through this seven inch gap. Right. And, and, and so who has that combination of skills? What human beings on earth have that combination of skills? And so Lee sent out a Facebook ad 
saying, hey, world, does anyone have this set of skills? He, he said, I'm looking for skinny scientists. He said, I'm a and he got some responses, and who ended up having those set of skills were six women. Who came to, but you also had to drop everything you were doing and come to South Africa for three weeks. That was the other, the, the other the trick to this. They went to South Africa in November of 2013. Uh, to begin excavating what we thought was a single skeleton lying on the surface of the cave. And they went down into the chamber through the seven inch gap, down the 40 foot drop into the Dean Aliti chamber, and they started recovering fossils. And they'd wrap them up in bubble wrap, put them in a little lunch pail, wrap them, put them in a lunch pail, wrap, and once the lunch pail was full, then somebody would bring it back up that 40 feet and wiggle your way up, like sort of up a chimney, to the top, back through the seven inch squeeze, and through, and eventually on the surface, people would unwrap them and catalog what it was that were, what was being discovered. And on day two, fossils in my pocket, um, on day two, there were a couple of fossils that were recovered. And one was a right femur, and the other one was a right femur. Is it one skeleton? Nope. Multiple skeletons, multiple individuals. And they kept going down and getting more and more and more and more. And after three weeks, they had recovered from this chamber 1,550 early human fossils from 15 individuals, 15 partial skeletons, 15 Lucy's, essentially. This was the most complete, or the, the, the largest, I should say, the largest collection of early human fossils ever recovered on the African continent. Essentially what happened in that three-week time is that the entirety of the human fossil record from Africa doubled in that work. It was absolutely extraordinary. And this was dangerous work. This wasn't easy work that they were doing. Uh, this was dangerous work, uh, and they did an absolutely extraordinary job finding these fossils. So they come up on the surface, and then the question is, what in the world are these things? And again, that's, that's where I get involved in this sort of project, is what are these things, studying the anatomy of them. Um, and they were an absolute joy to work with. These fossils are really special. And they were so much fun to work with, in part because there were so many of them, and you could see the variation, um, but they were giving us uh, a sort of anatomical completeness that we hadn't seen before in fossils. So oftentimes I work mostly on feet and legs and I get to work on a foot bone from one individual and another foot bone from another individual and for this species we have a foot, wow. a complete wow. foot. We also have complete hands, so there we go, right there, a hand from this creature as well. And as we started to examine it, head to toe, head, head, there you are, Head to toe, it was a different kind of thing than, again, we had ever seen before. Its head, its brain, was rather small. Okay, now I have a small head, but this thing is a much smaller head. About a third of the size of humans today. Um, its teeth, though, were shockingly human-like in their proportions and their shapes of very human-like teeth. It's a little snoutier than we are today, so its face is sticking out, a little more prognate, we would say. But the brain is small. A very human-like hand big thumb that would have been opposable and would have been able to do a sort of pad-to-pad -pad gripping. But the fingers, as the hand goes around, the fingers are very curved. Yeah, definitely take, take selfies with the hand, like in your hand. It's an awesome thing to do. Um, the fingers are really curved. And then the legs are almost identical to humans today. Some subtle differences, but they're very much like yours and mine. And so are the feet, although they're not as arched as most human feet today. So we think this is a creature that walked a lot like us, but its shoulder was more ape-like, its hands were more curved, its head was small, and its teeth were human-like. Again, this combination of anatomies that we hadn't seen before. So once again, it was named a new species. We called it Homo naledi. Naledi means star, uh, and this was named after the rising star cave where these fossils were found, to give uh, uh, some shout-out to the cave itself. It seems like um, this foot is huge compared to the... So, so uh, the hip is from a child, oh, okay. and the foot is from an adult. Yeah, we have in this collection of fossils. It's really interesting. We've got 15 identified individuals, and many, many, many children. It's actually a really sad collection of fossils to work with. Many children, um, many uh, old, uh, elderly individuals, very worn down teeth, and very few prime age adults which was curious as these fossils were coming up. The other thing curious as the fossils were coming up from the ground was that we weren't getting bones of other animals. 
So remember at Gladysdale, the first site I told you about, the 20,000 antelopes and zebras and wildebeest, this was the opposite problem, where there were no bones from other animals. And, and they kept going down to get more fossils, and the thought was, well, eventually they'll pull up the zebra, eventually they'll pull up the antelope, it's down there, it's got to be. And they didn't, and they never did. All we have from that collection of fossils are fossils of early humans. And this has never happened before in the history of our science. We have never found a fossil collection consisting only of early human ancestors. And so we started thinking about, you know, we puzzled over this. What could have caused this? And one of the thoughts initially was, okay, maybe there's a carnivore, maybe there's a leopard, because a lot of uh, uh, fossil sites in South Africa are dens of animals eating uh, uh, early humans and, and munching on them and dragging the bones into the cave, and that's how the bones got collected, or they got washed into the cave. And so we started looking for bite marks, because maybe there's some carnivore out there that likes to eat homo naledis and was running around and grabbing a homo naledi and dragging it down into the cave and munching on it. Where are the bite marks? They're not there. There are no bite marks. Okay, so we crossed that one off the list. We say, all right, maybe there are a bunch of homo naledis on the surface, uh, and, and there's a bad storm, and there's a flood, and they get washed into the cave. Or maybe, maybe they get lost, and they wander down into the cave, and they can't get out, and they die there. And this collection of bones is, is the result of them just getting lost. Well, if that was the case, then all of the bones would be in the same geological horizon, the same layer. They're not. The bones are stacked on each other, and there's separation. There's dirt between them. There's stratigraphy. This happened over time. This accumulated over time. These bodies were, were accumulated over time. So we went through all the different scenarios, and we were only left with one that we have hypothesized happened. And a lot of times I talk to audiences like this, and that's their first idea, is that these bodies were collected how? Burial. It's a burial, right. And you guys all say it's a burial, and I say it can't be. It can't be, because look at the size of the brain. It's a tiny, 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 tiny little brain. Those little guys doing something, that tiny brain creature doing something that culturally sophisticated? Really? Even Neanderthals. We, 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 uh, we had brain, bigger brains than we do, by the way. Um, we often would say that, they, that even in, with, with evidence that they buried their dead, that maybe they didn't. And maybe this is just a human thing. Maybe we misinterpreted these sites. So there's even controversy over Neanderthals burying their dead. And so to propose that something with a third of the size of the brain of a Neanderthal was deliberately disposing of its dead was crazy. It was very controversial, and yet we saw no other explanation. We see no other explanation. And so that's what we've hypothesized. And as happens in science, maybe we'll collect more evidence and show that we're wrong, and if we're wrong, oh well. That's how science works, right? Is that at the time you present what you think uh, 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 happened uh, with the current evidence that you have, and as more evidence is gathered, maybe you have to change your mind. And that's not a big deal, and we'll be happy to do that. But at the time, uh, or with the, uh, at this time, with the evidence we have, we think that they were deliberately disposing of their dead. That a homo naledi would die, and an individual would walk to the base of that seven inch gap, go up there, and shove the body through like a mail slot. And the bodies would accumulate over time down in that chamber. It's an extraordinary, extraordinarily complex behavior for such a small brand creature. And it shows us that, that things are probably, or, or behaviorally, and even anatomically, things are probably a lot more complicated than we first envisioned in human evolution. So I'll tell you about a couple other things, and then I'm happy to take questions. Um, these discoveries are so exciting to us, and have been so inspiring to us, and inspiring to all sorts of people who, who come to hear about them. Um, we realize that these fossils don't belong to us, um, they belong to everyone. And so what we've done is we have produced 3D scans of all of the fossils from both of the discoveries that I talked about today, and they're on a website called morphosource.org, morpho for shit, morphosource.org, and they're free. And you can just go there and download the fossils and have them as your screensaver if you want, <laughs> or you can print them out with a 3D printer. And some of the fossils that are going around uh, today um, are actual printouts from 3D printers. Um, now, now, most people don't have 3D printers in their houses yet, um, but there are companies that have 3D printers that you just send them the file and they'll send you the 3D printout of the object. And it's not terribly expensive. The best company I've come across is called Shapeways. 
Um, and it's perfect for holiday time. You can download a, ho a Homo Naledi jaw and give it out for gifts <laughs> at, at the holidays. I mean, you want anything else but a Homo Naledi hand or something. Um, anyway, so these are, these are really fun fossils. We're having a blast with them. We have so many new questions about human evolution. These discoveries have totally blown our minds. I would not have thought that any creature with this combination of anatomies existed. And yet, here they are, right in front of me. And so they've totally changed my thinking on the complexity of human evolution, how cool it was, and all these different experiments that went on in human evolution. And so I'll wrap up with, the, with just sort of the following observation that, that, that Lee Berger has made, and, and, and I think is, is spot on, that the fossils that he and his team, and, and we've discovered, these 2,000 fossils, essentially, that I've told you about tonight, they were found in the cradle of humankind, which is essentially the most searched area on Earth for these things, right? They were right under our nose the entire time. And they were discovered by an eight-year-old and by a couple of amateurs who had the, the guts or the craziness, I suppose, to squeeze through some seven-inch gap. If they hadn't done that, and if Matthew Berger hadn't tripped over that rock, we wouldn't know about these fossils, but they'd still be there. Which means, can you imagine how much more must still be out there, waiting to be discovered? So there's so much more out there for us to discover about our history and, and about our world. And I think these fossils demonstrate that. So thanks, and, and how about questions? So imitation might be the highest form of flattery. It's the lowest form of cognitive behavior. <laughs> the first thing that people did was throw it down the shaft, and they just imitated it. Yes. That question? I, yeah, repeat the well, I'm just I interested like in whether imitation was the source of them throwing the bodies down the shaft. They saw one person do it, whether to get rid of it or the smell or whatever it might have been. Sure, sure, and sure, they sure. Just didn't think beyond just imitating that. Yeah, and then and then it's 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 um, I mean it's beneficial, right? If you have a if an individual dies in the group and and it's still sitting there and still sitting there and still sitting there, eventually you're going to have some jackals and some hyenas coming to visit camp, and maybe that's not the best idea. And so there is some benefit to doing it, and yeah, it has to start with someone, right? There's this great example of um, this is a Japanese macaque uh, named uh, emu, uh, emo, emo, emo. And emo was provisioned with, uh, with food, with potatoes, it's, uh, in this area. It's a semi-provisioned uh, uh, area with Japanese macaques, lots of them. And there were potatoes that were thrown on the, on the, on the beach. And emo, and these macaques would pick up the potatoes and eat, but then there's sand, right? And you're trying to get the sand out, and you eat your potato, but it's sand. And emo would take the potatoes and walk over and wash them off in the water, and then eat them. And the other macaques are sort of, Wait, you can do that? Okay. And then they started doing it. Mostly the females, by the way. Emo was a female. The males, the adult males, didn't do it. Um, they then gave rice to them. And here's rice in sand. Right? You pick up a bunch of sand, and they're picking out the rice. And again, Emo went back to the water and dropped the rice in the sand in the water. The sand sinks, the rice floats, scoops the rice, eats it. And the other macaques watch this, and they replicate it. So I think you're spot on. Uh, yeah, that's how these cultural innovations have to start. It's somebody thinks of it, somebody comes up with a solution, it's a good idea, and others follow. Yeah. Now, one of the questions we have is, is, is whether these guys were replicating that by watching another species do it. That's possible, because we do have di evidence of different species of early humans coexisting. This is weird that there's just one of us left. It's really weird. You go back in any other point in our history, and there were multiple early, uh, there were multiple hominids, multiple upright walking apes coexisting and living in different ecologies and eating different things and, and living in different ways. Uh, and Homo sapiens now is the last tip of what was much, uh, uh, once a much more diverse branch. Mm -hmm. um, how would these um, creatures compare in brain size to like a modern chimp or like another modern ape? So a chimpanzee has a brain about the size of a Coke can. Um, so it's about 385 cubic centimeters, which is a little bit smaller than a, than a typical Coke can. Um, and these guys have a brain that's about 30% larger. Now, we have a brain that would be four, uh, about three and a half times that. 
uh, we have a brain that's about 1,300 cubic centimeters. So would it be reasonable to assume that it'd be more intelligent than the chimp? Uh, yeah, depending <laughs> on how you define intelligence, right? Because what chimps do, they do really, really, really well. Um, I, I, I spent some time with, with chimpanzees, and I was a lousy chimp. Um, I was not very good at it at all. Chimps do in their forests and their ecology, they do exceptionally well. Um, but I would, you know, I wouldn't say that humans are less intelligent than chimpanzees. And so, yeah, what I generally tell students is that um, look how amazing chimps are. Look at the extraordinary thing chimps do. Look how smart chimps are. And then, with this more encephalized creature of an Australopithecus or early Homo, um, it's going to be the, it's going to be that much smarter. How much smarter, and in what context, we don't know. Um, but yeah, it's likely that they're going to be they're going to be smarter, however you define it, right? Yeah. Just wondering about permissions, and is this on any sort of private property? Does the government get involved there? Just briefly. Yeah, that's something? a great question. So the antiquities laws in South Africa are different than the laws here. So if I go home and dug up a mastodon in my backyard, which would be awesome, um, it's mine. And I can, I can carry it around with me, I can display it in my yard, I can put it on eBay if I want it, it's mine. Um, South Africa doesn't work that way. Their antiquities laws are such that if you find something, well, anything older than 100 years old, okay, that's their cutoff is 100 years. So imagine that around here in New England. Um, everything in this room. Right? Um, not the people. Um, it belongs to South Africa. And so uh, by finding these fossils, uh, they are immediately property of the South African government. Uh, and you have to request through the South African government permission to excavate the fossils. And so when those two guys saw these bones and contacted Lee, Lee's first move was not to get the underground astronauts, these, these six women, it was to um, get permission from the, from the South African government to actually excavate there. Uh, and, they, and they moved it along quickly and gave them permission. Yeah. Norman? Uh, news on the date and the... Yeah. You the always box. ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're dodging on this one, but uh, uh, the, and the techniques, if you would comment on the new, the techniques that are being used in the dating process. Yeah, so um, dating these fossils have been uh, exceptionally difficult and frustrating. Um, when you find a new fossil site, um, and, and you know, they're, they're fossils of early humans, and you want to know how old they are. Are they 2 million years old? Are they 3 million years old? Are they 4 million years old? The, the, the quick and dirty back of the napkin way to do it and date these things is to look at the bones of other animals. Um, zebras have a very well understood evolutionary history. They go from a particular type of zebra to about two million years ago and we get the evolutionary shift to, to the modern genus Equus and their teeth change. So if you pick up the tooth and teeth, zebra teeth are everywhere. So you pick up a tooth of a zebra and it has a particular shape to it you can say, ah, it's Equus, and it must be younger than two million years. You don't know how much younger, but you know you're past two million. If you find a different kind of zebra tooth, and it looks differently, and, it, and it's just these shapes of the teeth are actually pretty easy to see, then you're older than two million years. Okay? The pigs work the same way. You find the warthog teeth, and you can tell more or less combination of the warthogs and the zebras and the elephants and the giraffes, and you can more or less figure out the general time period you're in. And then you, what you want to rely on is what we call radiometric dating, where you take samples of volcanic ash and you me measure the ratio of potassium to argon. Potassium's uh, radioactive and it decays into argon. In much the same way that those of you who had a beer poured for you tonight, if it's poured too quickly, you get a whole bunch of foam, and the foam slowly decays, slowly turns into the beer, and that can be really painful to watch that happen, because <laughs> it slowly decays. Um, that rate can be measured. And in the same way, radioactive potassium slowly deco decays into argon, uh, and that's something that we can measure in a laboratory. So if you take a sample of volcanic ash and measure the ratio of argon to potassium, you know how long the ash has been sitting there, and how, therefore how old the fossil sitting right next to the ash might be. Here's the problem. At Dinalitic, uh, in the Dinalitic chamber in South Africa, no volcanoes. So you can't do the potass potassium argon. There are no volcanoes in South Africa. And the other problem is, there are no bones of other animals, right? It's just the hominids. And so we've had a heck of a time dating these things. But what we are relying on now are these two techniques. Uh, one is to um, utilize the, the radioactivity of uranium. Everyone knows uranium is radioactive, right? No one has uranium pillows. 
And so uranium <laughs> is a radioactive material that decays into lead at a known rate, and it gets dropped off in the limestone deposits uh, through the movement of groundwater. And the limestone is what makes up the cave itself. And so the bones are wedged between a couple layers of the cave, and you can measure the ratio of uranium to lead in these different layers and date the bones sandwiched between the layers. That's one of the ways that we're, we're looking into dating these fossils. Uh, we're, we're attempting to carbon date them, just in case. Um, and the other way is to, is to do a, 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 a method where you look at the, uh, the movement of electrons out of their electron shell uh, using the enamel of the teeth. And that's a much more complicated method, but that's being employed as well. Oh. Yeah. 100,000? Where are we now? Yeah. So yeah, so um, from the anatomy of the bones, I would have guessed 2 million. Okay, that's, that was my guess. Um, others guessed older, others guessed younger. The people who worked on the skull have done a very detailed analysis of the skull, and they said it would make sense if it's about a million years old, about one million, um, and we're getting uh, uh, some pieces of evidence that it's younger than that. Yeah, which is really fun, because it means that, that they're coexisting with things that are, that are like Homo erectus, which is probably familiar to a lot of folks, uh, which would be the immediate ancestor of Homo sapiens, coexisting with something like this. So again, the landscape was filled with early humans. The, How about the sediment, or the calcium? How old is the cave itself? Uh, that hasn't been released yet. Yeah, we don't know the age of the cave itself yet, but that's being worked on. Because you can't have bones in a cave unless there's a cave. And so the, cave, the age of the cave itself is being examined. Yeah. Yeah. How are you dating enamel on a tooth if it's fossil? Yeah. So what you can so the, the the enamel itself does become mineralized to some degree, but what happens over the course of that process is that the electrons that are that are that are making up the the enamel itself, as they're being exposed to radioactivity in the area, get popped out of their electron shells, and they have to be in some sort of prism-like grid. So this happens with quartz and it happens with enamel. We have really structured material that traps these electrons. And then what you could do is you can take it back to a laboratory and study how many of those electrons have been, have been sort of sent out of their shells and trapped like that. How long have they not been exposed to either heat or sunlight? How long have they been buried becomes the question. Because once you're exposed to sunlight, the, the electrons go back to where they're supposed to be. Once they're exposed to, radi to, to some degree of ener some energy, whether it's heat or, or, or sunlight. Um, so it's this really cool technique called op uh, optical uh, stimulant uh, uh, res uh, uh, luminescence, luminescence, or thermoluminescence if you're doing it to date things that have been heated, uh, like fires if you're trying to date the earliest hearths or things like that. Yeah, so it's a really fun technique. It's relatively new, um, you know, newer than radiometric dating at least, those sort of volcanic ashes I was talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you describe the cave for us? Because I'm trying to picture a cave that's light enough, has enough light in it, for these creatures to find this shelf and to see that there's that there's some kind of a shaft back there. Yeah. Um, this is yeah. This is troubling. Um, <laughs> there's so many things about this that are troubling uh, in terms of how these bones get down there, um, and one of them has to do with light. Um, and so our initial thought was that they had fire. Um, and so we looked for that, and we scraped the ceiling to look for fire residue, and there's none. There's nothing at all. So there's no evidence that they were using any fire. Um, and so what I didn't, I didn't even tell you the, the, another piece to this story is that these underground astronauts, these six women who did this work, um, they would go into the cave, and there's a drop immediately down into the cave, um, and then you have a, a, a gap that's called Superman's crawl to get through. And that's only 10 inches high. And it's called Superman's because the only way to get through is to pretend you're Superman and wiggle your way through. And then you go to the other side and you get to the base of something called Dragon's Back. And Dragon's Back is filled with this really jagged rock that they would then walk, go up, climb up. And uh, it would tear at their clothes and it would rip their skin up pretty badly. They would come out bloodied. Um, and then you've got the 7 inch gap. And then you have to squeeze through. Um, fortunately, what's been discovered by mapping the cave itself, so a lot of work has gone in, in the last couple of years. This was you know, discovered in 2013, announced to the world in 2015, and people are still working there and doing an extraordinary amount of work. And some of that work is just mapping the cave system itself. Because there's not a single straight shot to get to the base of Dragon's Back. It turns out that there's another way to get to the base of Dragon's Back. And so most likely what these homo naledis were doing 
uh, if in fact this is deliberate disposal of the dead, is they were just walking to the base of Dragon's Back, and it was still somewhat light by the time they got there, and then walked up Dragon's Back and shoved the bodies through. Now, down in the Enolatic Chamber, it's completely dark. It's in the dark zone. Um, and so, and so there's, you know, even if you're a, a jackal, I mean, think about the stink that would have made, right? Yes. And if you're some jackal on the outside, sniff, 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 maybe you get to the base of Dragon's Back, and maybe you climb up a little bit, sniff, 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 but it's dark in there. And so maybe you decide not to go in. Um, and, and that might explain the absence of bones of, of other animals. Um, I should correct myself. There are no bones of other large animals. We do have um, a couple of rodent teeth, and we have some owl bones. And we think the rodent was in the owl, but the owl got down in there, flew around, got lost, 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 died. And that's why we've got the owl bones and the rodent teeth nearby. And that's the only set of bones out of almost 2,000 bones, the only bones from other animals. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. You know what? Any sense that the uh, cave itself has changed over the... Yeah, so our geologists have worked on this, and I'm not a geologist, so I don't have the expertise in this to really answer your question as, as well as I, 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 I would like to be able to. But there are geologists who have looked at the, at the, the system itself. There's one geologist who was able to squeeze in, and he was looking for the other entrance. He was saying, well, there's got to be another way to get in here. And he walked around the perimeter and searched the ceiling, and there was, nothing. There was no other way of getting in. Um, now, there might be some uh, sagging that would have happened over time. Uh, there might be some changes in terms of, of, of uh, pathways and entryways. There might be some cave collapses in areas. But in the region that I've described, there's no evidence for that at all. Um, so cave collapses, you can see. You can tell that something has collapsed and filled in. There's nothing like that at all. Uh, but we think there has been some sagging of some of the, the areas making those squeezes a little tighter than they probably were in the past. Mm -hmm. um, to the surviving hypothesis of male drop, yeah. Uh, possible drop. Uh, two things. How do you uh, explain the body that was laid out straight? And and second, um, on the very difficult portal to get to, to push you through, I'd expect then you'd have either a pyramidal collection yeah. of bones, yeah, 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 yeah. or if it's settled, Absolutely. at least a density in the yep. center and with very... Um, Fewer bones as you go radiating out. Exactly, exactly. We don't know that yet. We don't know yet because um, the area that's been excavated, this is actually good. Okay, so the Dean Lady Chamber itself is about the size of this room. Okay, so not you guys, sorry. But it's not, you know, probably that wall there, this size of this room. And what has been excavated has been in the center of the room and it's about the size of this table. Okay. That's where the 1,500 fossils came from. And there are bones everywhere. We estimate that there are thousands of more bones to be recovered. And the expectation would be that they would be concentrated underneath the yes. entry point, yes. that that would be the greatest density, and you would be able to measure uh, a density change as you moved away from the entry. Yeah. So that's one of the predictions from this hypothesis, that if we're right, then this is how the bones should be arranged. And now we can test it. Yeah. Um, and we can go and excavate more. This is going to be an extraordinary amount of work. I mean, this is something that's going to take place over, over the course of decades. Um, this, this volume of, of excavation that's going to take place. Now, anatomically, we still have tons of questions about these guys. Um, there are parts of the body that haven't been discovered. For instance, uh, we don't have a hyoid yet. It'd be really nice to have a hyoid. Why do I want a hyoid? Speech. Speech, yeah, yeah. So the shape of the hyoid is very different in a chimpanzee and in a, and in a human, and it might give us some insight into whether these language. these early yeah into language, the origins of language. He's so much fun to have a hyoid. So we'll get one. We'll get one eventually. Um, now there, uh, there, I said that there's continued work that's happening there. Uh, one of the the researchers, or two of the researchers, moved to to South Africa. Two of the uh, underground astronauts moved to South Africa. One is doing a postdoc, and she's continuing the excavations. But she's continuing the excavations at a different chamber. Um, and so they, we've found another chamber. It's not just the Dean Elite chamber. There is another one. And as, as you said, you must have heard me say this somewhere else. Um, there is a skeleton just kind of lying there. Um, and we saw it in March. Um, it's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. This is my graduate student, uh, Ellie. Um, and Ellie's working on, on the feet and legs of Homo as, as well, mostly on the heel. 
Um, but there's a skull, it's a complete skull, and there's a skeleton. Um, uh, not complete, but, but they're working on it. Mm -hmm. You're talking about excavating at the bottom of a cave. Why do you need to excavate? Is the limestone gripping, or why aren't they just lying there? So they are lying there. Um, the, sur the first surface ones, there was no excavation necessary. And you could just pluck a bone and wrap it up, pluck a bone, wrap it up. Um, and then when I say excavate, what I mean is using essentially you know, paintbrushes and toothbrushes and tiny little dental picks and porcupine quills to slowly uh, etch away and remove the dirt uh, and slide the dirt away. And then there would be a higher, uh, you know, another concentration of bone and the bone would be picked up and then slowly move that, that soil away. Um, there is, uh, there's no hardened, uh, you know, the, the, the rock that I was handing around a moment ago, this thing here, um, that's what most South African caves are like, this hardened, what we call breccia, where the limestone has been dripping down onto the soil, hardening it like a concrete. Uh, that is not what this situation is like at all. It's very different um, where there's a clay and a soil that just flakes away from the bone. It is a, it is a paleontologist's dream. <laughs> it's extraordinary. So it's dust that's gotten in there? It, we think, it, so all the, the sedimentologists who have worked on, you know, this, this dirt that's here, what is it? Where did it come from? Did it blow in from the outside? Um, and it didn't. It came from the cave itself. So the cave is, is exactly, the cave is flaking, slowly flaking, and that's what's composing the soil within the cave that the bodies have been um, uh, being deposited into. Yeah. And it's probably, to some degree, the rotting of the bodies as well that's contributing to the, to the soil composition. Chris, yeah? So what kind of evidence would allow you to confirm or disprove the hypothesis that this was used as a burial site. Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. Um, so if we continue to excavate and we find a whole boatload of zebras, then it's most likely that the Homo is not dragging zebra carcasses down there and shoving them through. Um, so that's the sort of thing that I would look for, is, is um, a more varied ecology in that, in that deposit. Uh, but if all we get are the Homo naledis still, then... Um, uh, it'd be difficult to come up with another scenario. There may be another way to explain it, uh, but we haven't been able to come up with it. But that's one of the ways to disprove it, I think, is to show that, look, uh, we, we happened upon an area of high concentration of just the human bones, but it turns out that this wider area is filled with bones of other animals, too. Now, the women who were down there excavating, um, they didn't see bones of other animals at all, and they looked. Um, so if they're down there, they're, they're, they're buried deeper. Uh, but that's one way I think we could disprove it. Um, if we find bite marks all over the bones, that might be a way to do it. Um, there was a recent pushback against this idea, and we invite that. I mean, it's great to have colleagues saying, eh, I don't buy it, maybe it was this. Uh, there's some uh, black staining on the bones that um, is a, a manganese deposit. And one of our colleagues has argued that that happens in the context of lichen growth, and that this would be evidence that they were exposed to the sun and that lichen would have grown on them, and then they got washed down into the cave after the fact. And so now, all of a sudden, everyone's saying, well, who knows about how lichen grows? Let's, let's do a 10-year experiment of how lichen grows. And so we're out there trying to find colleagues who work on lichen growth in South Africa. Um, and so there are, there are some other hypotheses that have been put forth. Um, but uh, yeah, the lichen one is, 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 is one possible. That these would be surface finds. The problem with them being washed into the cave is that no rocks, no sticks, no bones of other animals got washed in. It was just the homonoletes, which seems unlikely. So just along these lines, any evidence of death by traumatic injury? No, no, none at all. Um, yeah, 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 we looked for it. Um, and we have some paleo uh, forensic folks who are looking at that as well, who have a much sharper eye for that sort of thing. Um, so because the fossils have just been out of the ground for three years, what we've been able to do is, is describe the basic anatomy, but now all the fun work begins. And for me, the fun work is reconstructing in detail gait analysis, exactly how is this creature walking around its world, was it utilizing the trees, that sort of thing. Other people are now trying to reconstruct the diet. Um, and then you have paleoforensics people's mo people moving in saying, you know, was there any, is there any evidence of cause of death? Um, and sometimes you do get great evidence of cause of death. So back to our, our wonderful little Tong child here. Um, oh, poor Tong. 
uh, was killed by an eagle. Uh, a bird of prey uh, would have swooped down and grabbed Tong by the orbits and flown off with, with it. There are um, talon puncture marks right through the orbits of this poor little, little kiddo. Um, and so we can tell cause of death sometimes. There are bones that have leopard bite marks right through them. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, Australopithecus sediba, the, 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 the one I talked about at the very beginning, uh, he's around there somewhere. I don't know where he is. Oh, he's on my tie. Um, so this guy, uh, cause of death here we think is that he fell, that he and his mom would have, may have fallen into the cave, um, that, that uh, there's evidence from the bones that's consistent with individuals who have fallen from a great height and putting their arms up to brace themselves, and they break their arms, and then there's a break on his mandible that's consistent with a fracture from a, a fall from a, from a great height. So um, they may have been running from a leopard or something, and off they go across the grassland, and they don't see the hole, and down they go uh, into the hole. Um, and this is, you know, a lot of people I tell this to, and they say, why didn't they see the hole? Um, we've been walking around that landscape, uh, and you don't see the holes in the ground. Um, it's really creepy, actually, to be walking along, and then someone just grabs your hand, and you kind of, you know, look, and there's a 50-foot drop right there. So the landscape is just, it's like Swiss cheese. It's, it's pockmarked with all these, these vertical case shafts, and these guys wouldn't have seen it, necessarily. Back to Homo naledi, there's no evidence of trauma to the bones. We don't know how they died. Uh, but what we do know is that lots of kids and lots of elderly. Right. And it's very similar to what you see in a, in a, you know, a New England graveyard. Uh, you know, 1700s, 1800s New England graveyard. You just go, uh, and you get lots of kids and lots of elderly. Um, so it's consistent with this idea of, of, of a, a gathering of, of, of the dead bodies. Let's do two more questions, and then I'm sure Jeremy will hang around after. Yeah, the only evidence of Naledi so far is this one concentration. Yes, yeah. So no place else. Well, you know what's fun is that at lots of other cave sites throughout South Africa, tons of them, you find like an isolated tooth, or you find a jaw, or you find a radius or something like that. And, well, what is it, right? It doesn't come with a label, so you compare it to what you know, and you say, all right, well, this doesn't quite look like a Homo erectus, but eh. That's, that's the, you know, the right age and the right place, so I'm going to call it a homo erectus, or I'm going to call it a homo sapiens, or I'm going to call it a homo habilis, or something like that. When you make a new discovery like this, that head to toe we have the anatomy, we now get to go back and re-examine everything. And say all of the stuff that was just isolated, we can now say, wait a minute here, maybe this wasn't just a homo erectus, maybe this is a homo naledi. And maybe we do have evidence, maybe we've already found evidence of it, and it's been miscataloged. Um, it would not be surprising to me at all if that was the case. And so we already have some candidates for that. Um, so that's fun. You know, and it means, uh, you know, for, for, for PhD students and for, uh, for, you know, for my undergrads, like, whenever, whenever we make this, what I try to reinforce them is whenever we make new discoveries, yeah, you get new answers. You get some nice answers to questions you had. But now you've got a ton of new questions that you never even thought to ask prior to making that discovery. So science never stops. You know, new discoveries always lead to new questions. So last question. You get the last question. Um, do you guys know if there was like a sickness or like a sacrifice that happened to the sacrifice? We don't know. We don't know. It's a great question. The question was about whether they were sick. Can we tell if they were sick or not? And can we tell if there was something, some sacrifice or if there was some ritualistic thing about their death? And sometimes you can tell. So there are some bones we have, for instance, there's this great skull from Ethiopia. It's about a half a million years old. And it has cut marks all over its cheekbones. And it has cut marks on parts of its skull. And it looks like it was ritualistically defleshed half a million years ago. I know, it's pretty creepy. Well, it's Halloween time, so... You know. <laughs> so so we, we have, we can, you can see, sometimes you can see in the bones what may have caused this to happen. And sometimes you could never see in the bones what the cause of death was. So we have lots of skeletons, and we look at them, and obviously something went wrong because they're skeletons, right? Obviously they died. But we can't tell from their bones how or, or why they died. And it could be the case that these homo naledis had some disease, um, and, and it doesn't manifest itself in the skeleton. You can't see it in its bones uh, at all. Um, or maybe you can, and no one's figured out how to do it yet, and you're the one that's going to figure out how to do it. <laughs>
if anyone wants to say anything, feel free. I'll have these guys here for a while.